Good evening. It is good to see everyone here tonight. Always, always what a delight it is to have the invitation to come back to Lake City and to be a part of your services here, but more importantly to me, to get to see so many of our family members and friends that we love so dearly. And it was funny, Michelle has a birthday uh, this week and uh, we were cutting up. She was 24 when we moved here years ago and She's knocking on 50's door right now. So uh, what we thought was interesting, Noah is now 25, which is older than than Michelle was. We moved here many years ago. And so a lot of y'all have really aged over the years. And, uh, but uh, I'm glad I haven't. And so, uh, but I am always delighted. I uh, find it interesting that, um, you know, several years ago, for those who may not know us, of course, I'm Ryan and my wife, Michelle, uh, I'm the director for the Youth Impact Center in Lanier County uh, up in Lakeland in Georgia. And uh, we started that program about seven and a half years ago. Uh, made a decision in uh, May of that year to get out of the pulpit and stop local work and uh, get into the nonprofit world and begin to serve underserved kids and to help them. And our program is designed that we're able to uh, uh, feed kids every day a hot meal. We uh, are helping with their homework, education tutoring, things of that nature. We also have a Bible class for all of our students every day. And so we have over 100 elementary age kids who come through our door every day who get loved on. And so many of you in this congregation, as well as the congregation as a whole, have supported it uh, for over these last seven years. And, uh, and, and God has blessed us tremendously. In the last seven years, we've been able to raise over $2 million uh, to renovate facility and to do the programming that we're doing and uh, being able to just impact stands for I must personally advance Christ today and so our whole goal was to be able to um, just to shine the light of Christ and introduce a lot of kids who would never be introduced to Jesus in a way that would demonstrate love uh, and through that program we are now uh, able to expand uh, we have really not let this out very much but um, we have just signed the uh, a new uh, not a lease, but a building agreement with Eccles County, which is in Statonville, uh, not too far above the state line there. The county there just recently purchased an old IGA facility of over 10,000 square feet. They donated it to us. And so what we did in Lanier County, we're about to do in Eccles County and in Clinch County. Uh, the Boys and Girls Club of the state of Georgia has uh, made a decision to merge with us uh, under our leadership and that we can take our character program, our Bible-based cu curriculum, into the statewide Georgia, uh, statewide in Georgia, Boys and Girls Club. And so God has opened up some amazing doors from avenues where God wasn't even being able to be spoken to now of opening up doors to be able to not only, and what we're doing, but to expand that ministry in so many different areas. Uh, when I stepped out of the pulpit in May, of that year, uh, I received a phone call from the congregation in Waycross, where ironically is where I left when I came here. And the church there had gone through a really bad uh, situation there with some things going on, and they hadn't gotten down to eight members. And um, they had called me, one of the men, and they said, listen, we know you're not preaching full time anymore, but would you come and fill in for about three months for us and give us a chance to breathe and decide what we're going to do. We don't know if we're going to just close the doors, maybe merge with another congregation, try to hire another preacher. We, we have no idea what we're going to do, but we don't want to make an immediate decision. Would you come and help us out for a few months? So seven and a half years later, I'm still at Waycross <laughs> preaching on Sundays. I keep saying, y'all aren't looking, right? And so I, I got out of local work, and uh, of course I teach class at the church in Lakeland on Wednesday nights, and I've been preaching now uh, in Waycross for the last seven and a half years, but we do not have a Sunday night service. We have a, an earlier, and so having that opportunity to come down here tonight and me and she, me, Michelle being able to spend some time with you, I'm very grateful for. Uh, and so I want to invite you to open up your Bible to uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, and we're going to do a study tonight of uh, a study that something that, that I've kind of been dealing with for the last few weeks. Hope that you can gain something by it from the standpoint of 
uh, of maybe what's going through my mind, but it may be some of the challenges that you find yourself going through as well. If you're taking notes, we're going to have three points tonight, and our points are going to be the situation that Paul found himself in, the struggles he faced, and then the solution he found. And if we can look at what Paul maybe had gone through in his life, and then maybe there's an application that we can make within our own lives. So I hope that you'll follow through with me. And what's interesting here is I'm going to read this passage in Romans 7 out of the King James. Now, I don't know if you have a different translation, so it may be a different word, but I encourage you to go home and study this from different versions, from the newest translation that you can find through what different ones, because when I start reading this, I will more than likely get tongue-tied myself, and about halfway through, you're going to be saying, what did he just say? Because it is one of those passages that you really have to read several times. But I hope tonight we can read it and then maybe break down what Paul's saying. Romans chapter 7. This is fixing to demonstrate something. Mr. Ryan's golden reading glasses. Romans chapter 7 beginning at verse 14. <clears throat> For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do I. If then I do that which I would not, I can sin unto the law that is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more that I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into the captivity of the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So, so we have a situation here. <clears throat> And I want you to understand, first and foremost, that the Apostle Paul is the one who is writing this. Now, Paul was one of the greatest, if you will, the apostles that was chosen by God, probably at least my, my mind and my thoughts, because, you know, we look at the miraculous abilities that he had. We look at all the things. Does anybody got a glass of a, a bottle of water in this building? <clears throat> or just give me a cup. That'd be fine. If not, y'all going to be hearing me clear my throat all night long. <clears throat> and so the Apostle Paul, the things that he could do, just think about being chosen by God to be this great man that would come and be used by God for all these miraculous spiritual abilities. Paul had the ability literally to raise men from the dead, to be able to be the one who inspired and be inspired by God to write the majority of what we have now is the New Testament. This man was on a spiritual level that I cannot even begin to fathom, but he's the one that wrote this. Notice the situation in verse 14. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual. In other words, I know what the law says. I know that the Bible is inspired of God. I know that the Bible literally is God-breathed. Paul knew this greater than we could even begin to fathom because, if I do that, I'll get choked on it, but appreciate you. But if I can, if, if the now, we can't even begin to fathom because he understood because God had inspired him. He knew the words that he wrote was not from him, but from God. So he knew more than anybody that the law was spiritual. But, he said, I am carnal. I am worldly. I'm fleshly. I am unspiritual, the word is. I know that the Bible, the law, is the Word of God. But I'm man. Sold under sin. Enslaved, if you will, to those fleshly desires. Paul finds himself in a... Thank you so much. Paul finds himself in a situation 
where he realizes, I know what God wants me to do. I know what God's Word tells me to do. But I've got this carnality, this unrighteousness, this flesh that keeps pulling at me. Let me kind of tell you the background of where this sermon started a few weeks ago. Again, we have, you know, well over 100 kids, and I was out, we have a new playground, and, and I was watching the kids, and they were playing tug-of-war. They had a rope, and it started out with just two boys, and one would pull, and, and they were pretty well matched, and it really wasn't making much headway, you know, and it pulled a little bit this way and a little bit that way, and I was sitting there on the picnic table, and I was watching them, and one of the little boys called over to his friend, and as soon as his friend grabbed the rope, it started going that way a little bit, and then the other one called his friend, and you know how the story goes. The more people, the more it tug, and, and eventually the side that had the most people or the biggest people, of course, they would win, and then the other side would call for one of the teachers, you know, one of the leaders to come over. And then the older ones would grab the rope. And, and I thought about them and I was watching that tug of war. And I said, that's my life. I find myself, even after being a Christian for over 30 years, of having that same struggle. Uh, of that being pulled to one side and pulled. I, I feel very righteous sometimes and very spiritual, but then this flesh takes over and I find myself doing things that I shouldn't do or, or saying things I shouldn't say. And so there's this tug of war going back and forth with me. And, and I remember this passage. And so now I see not just the situation that Paul said. The situation is, I know what the Bible says, but I'm man. The struggle is what? The struggle is this tug of war between the, the, the world and God, or good and evil, righteous and unrighteous. And, and it's not just that this one verse. If you want to hold your finger here and just flip over a few pages, go over to Galatians chapter 5. And you remember here again, Paul was writing this, but I just want you to see a couple of verses and we'll go back to Romans 7. But Paul, right before he talks about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, Notice what he says in verse 17. For the flesh lusteth after the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that they cannot do the things that they would. And so he said, wait a minute. And he goes through and he talks about the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh. But he says they're contrary. There's this battle, there's this tug of war between the Spirit and the flesh. Look at another one. Go ahead and open your Bible up. Uh, to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. James writes, From whence comes wars and fighting among you? Come they not hence, even of your own lust, that war in your members? You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have, and you cannot obtain. You fight and war, you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world was enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Again, there's the battle. Let's look at one more before we go back to Romans. Go to um, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And, and, and again, another apostle here, just giving these great words of wisdom. In verse 11, he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, these desires, which what? War against the soul. Having your conversation, having your manner of life, if you will, uh, honest among the Gentiles, that wherein as you speak evil against, I'm sorry, against you as evildoers, that may be good works, which shall behold glorifying God in the day of visitation. Passage after passage throughout the Scripture, these great men of God, men who were inspired by God to write the Scriptures, were individuals who were struggling with the same thing I struggle with as a, a Christian of over 30 years who's been in the pulpit for a long time. I know what the Bible says. I know what I'm supposed to do. But then there's this fleshly side that tries to consume me and it wars within my soul. And, and, and we know that feeling. And so Paul is going through that struggle. And so as he goes through that struggle, how many verses do we read about putting on what? The whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6. Why? Because we can withstand those fiery darts of Satan. We look at those things and we begin to say, now in my life, 
what side of that tug of war am I feeding? So as I watched those kids play on the playground, and as they were standing there just one-on-one, it was pretty even. But as soon as one side began to be fed, if you will, it began to lean that way. And then the other side, that way. And and, and those can be a good or bad, okay? And, and, And so which side of that tug of war are we feeding? Because when we think about it, we're at war. And so who do we feed? Now, the way that we feed that is through what? Things like entertainment, people in relationships, activities, complacency. You know, I find myself a lot of times feeding the wrong side and find myself drifting off to a side that I shouldn't. I know what the Bible says, but I find myself all of a sudden doing something I shouldn't do. Saying something I shouldn't say. And, and, then, and then I was like, wait, wait a minute. And, and then I, I try to get that other side back and I start praying and I start studying and I, I maybe try to, to get some activities at church, you know, and, and fellowship so that I can get that other side filled back up. And no matter how many times we do it, that tug of war keeps going back and forth. Struggle. The struggle is real. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, again, we're told to put on <clears throat> the whole armor of God. Now, I'm going to share a couple of verses with you as we get into the solution. Because I think we understand the situation. And if we're honest with ourselves, I think all of us, regardless of who you are, have that struggle, whether we want to admit it or not. The main thing is the solution. But I want you to remind you of a couple verses before we get to the solution. Galatians 2 verse 20. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So even in that verse, Paul acknowledges he has crucified the old man. He's put him to death. He's obeyed the gospel. And now the life that he lives in the flesh, he lives by the faith of the Son of God. And so even though we crucify the old man, even though we put him to death and we rise from the watery grave of baptism to walk in the newness of life, to be refreshed and renewed, you still are flesh. So Galatians 2 verse 20, but then Luke chapter 14 verse 27 When Jesus talks about to be a follower of him, you must what? Die daily. To pick up your cross. Think about what Paul said, I am crucified. And the Lord says, pick up your cross and die daily. Now I want you to remember that as we continue going through this. Because beginning the situation. I know that's the Bible. I know what it says, but I'm flesh. The struggle is I'm doing things that I shouldn't do, that I know I shouldn't do, and I'm not doing the things I should be doing to do, even though I know I should be doing those things. So Paul was going back and forth in this battle in his mind. Oh, why am I doing these things and not these things? Why am I doing not those? And so there's a struggle. We see that. So what's the solution? Let's look down in verse 24. This is still part of the struggle, but you'll start seeing as it bleeds into the solution. Oh, wretched man that I am. Let's pause there. Oh, wretched. Oh, miserable man. You see, Paul knew what the Bible said, but yet he knew he was still doing the things he ought not to do, and therefore he was miserable. And I know you feel it. If you have any spirituality in you, and I know that you're here tonight because you love God and you are spiritual, that's why you come tonight. And so I know that when you, just like me, struggle and we mess up, I feel horrible. I I, I know I shouldn't have done that. I know I shouldn't have said that. Whatever it might be. And, And that misery comes within us and that guilt feeling. Paul says, the Oh, wretched, miserable man that I am. And I love that Paul said, I am. 
He's making it personal. He's letting them know that Romans, yeah, you're going through some things. You're going through some challenges, but nothing that I haven't gone through myself, even as an apostle of Jesus Christ, that I am. That's present tense. And we need to understand the accountability in our life of saying, listen, you know, we need to quit pointing our fingers at everybody else and telling them what they're doing wrong and realize that we make those same mistakes. We're all sinners who uh, fall short of the glory of God. And so how encouraging was it to the Romans when he's, you know, he's having to get on to them throughout this letter, but he says, but I struggle with it. And I'm miserable. This is who I am. Who shall deliver me? Here comes a solution, right? Who? Wait a minute, Paul. You could raise the dead. You were inspired by God. The power that Paul possessed, the, the knowledge, the, the, the prestige, the whatever, the prominence that Paul... You mean to tell me you couldn't do it, Paul? If anybody could have done it, Paul would have been the one who could have done it, but he couldn't. He said, who's going to what? Deliver me. He knew that he couldn't do it by himself. Notice that, deliver me. Deliver me from what? I think about being delivered. <laughs> How many times in the scriptures do you see people who God delivered? Quickly, you think about maybe Daniel in the lion's den, delivered. The three Hebrew youth in the fiery furnace, delivered. Even Paul writing to the Colossians says that God will deliver you from the power of darkness, translate you into the kingdom of his dear son. God is the one who delivers us. And so Paul said, who shall deliver me? Deliver me. And we need to understand, what is he asking to be delivered from? He's asking in the context, deliver me from this struggle of misery that I know I shouldn't be doing that, but I'm doing it. Even though I know the Bible tells me not to do it, I'm still doing it. I know that the law is right. I know that the Bible is inspired. But there's a struggle. Deliver me from this. Deliver me. Again, Paul was dealing with sin just like we do. Sin of his life. Sin of his past. Paul, if you don't know much about him, you might want to read a little bit. He persecuted the church. He took people's lives because of their faith in God. He held the coat of the men who stoned Stephen. Uh, we're probably not even shared a glimpse of the things that Paul, the, the, the challenges in his life from the past. But it didn't change. He still, even as an apostle, was still man. And, and so he says, deliver me from the struggle. Now, notice this last phrase here. Deliver me from the body of death. The body of death. There's a couple of different thoughts that scholars believe that this deals with. I'm going to tell you the one that I lean more to and, and through most commentators will share this same idea. But during that period of time, the way that many times people will be punished for their crime, and I apologize for the, the scene that I'm about to paint here, but literally they would shackle a dead corpse to their bodies. So a person who was you know, guilty of a crime, there would be a dead body shackled to your ankles and to your wrist and your face. So you carried around a dead body. And you can imagine in your mind, first thing I thought of was the smell. But as that body would literally rot and decay, the things that people would see, the, the way they would stay away from you, but then that old body infecting your body to the point of your death. Who would deliver me from this body of death? That's how he felt. This old man, this fleshly man, who's going to deliver me from it? He felt like he was still shackled to... This man who's infecting his body. The answer is only God. Again, if you go back to Romans chapter 7, the last verse of that chapter says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So then with this, the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. The struggle's there. I'm going to serve God. Over the years, I'm not going to say many, some, people have come to me and they said, Ryan, I, I, I can't do this religious thing. I can't do this Christian thing. I'm like, what, what's going on? Listen, there's too much of an expectation. If God expects me to do all that, there's no way I can keep it up. I, why should I even try? I, I might as well just give up. There's no reason that I, I can't do all the things He asked me to do and, and be faithful to God and, and, and like everybody else. I, I can't be like brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Look at them. And they give up. Because there's an expectation in the mind, and maybe we portray that in church. If it's the truth, we need to be careful. And I'm afraid that I have over my years of preaching, but we portray this, that sinless perfection of Christianity. That, we, that God, you know, expects us to be perfect. We're not. We're not this resort for the saints, but a hospital for sinners. And when we acknowledge, I make mistakes. I sin. I struggle. That's what Paul was doing here. And I think that was an encouragement. How many people in the world today who are outside of Christ may be encouraged if we quit putting on our halos and walk around like we all that and, and, and never have sin? And people realize, you know what? We struggle. But by the grace of God and through Jesus Christ, I'm saved. You see, John writes about when we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. Again, out of the King James Version, if you're one who studies out of it, most words that end in the word e or the letters E-T-H is a continuous action. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, not that you believe in him one time, but it's a continuation that's what John's saying. He says, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us, continuously cleanses us of our sin. But if you make a decision to walk in darkness, that blood's going to stop cleansing you. When you finally say, you know what? I quit. I can't do it no more. I'm done, and you walk away from God, then you're out of fellowship. But as long as we're trying, as long as we're, we continue to walk and do the things we need to do, that blood's going to cleanse us. So we need to stop acting like we don't have any problems so the world can know the truth. How many more people may come to God if they know they didn't have to be perfect? Because, man, if you're looking for the perfect church, the perfect group of people, this ain't it. I know some of y'all. I know a lot of y'all. But even if I didn't, guess what I'd say? This ain't it. If Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, couldn't do it, why do we think we can? But then we act like we do. And we don't. And we don't share our struggles with one another. And so then we end up falling away or doing things we shouldn't do. I've had those conversations. I, I talk to people and said, Ryan, I just had nobody to talk to. Nobody understands what I'm going through. So they turn to alcohol or they turn to drugs or they turn to the arms of somebody who is not their spouse. And they're trying to find that calmness in the storm because they're going through struggles that nobody understands because all of us get out of the car we got a big smile on our face. How was your day? It was wonderful. Oh, everything's great. And what reality is, you're just beating your young in 30 seconds before you got here, screaming at your spouse. It wasn't, it was a struggle. But why do we put on these faces and this attitude? Just, we need to start being real. I love that passage. And so I hope that it maybe it, it encouraged you tonight that if you're struggling, like me, and it's okay to struggle. It's okay to, to mess up, if you will. We're all sinners who fall short of the glory of God. But don't give up. Strive. Put on those fruit of the Spirit. The Beatitudes. The Christian graces. All those virtues. Continue to build that out. Because what you're doing in that, you're, you're stocking that side of the tug of war. And when the time starts pulling, it's a little harder to pull because you continuously to feed that side. And people are, I don't need Bible class. I don't need Christian fellowship. I, I come on Sunday morning, that's enough. Well, guess what? In that tug of war, you're going to lose every time. 
Feed the good side. If you're here tonight and, and you're not even a Christian, you know, the faithful never need to reach the goal of righteousness. But as long as you dwell in the flesh until you crucify that old body of sin daily, you'll never understand the importance of the relationship that we have with God. People who are not Christians, what hope do you have? If heaven's not my home, what will I do? Maybe you've been thinking about it. Maybe you've been studying. Maybe you have whatever question in your mind that makes sure your relationship with God is what it's supposed to be. It's not some prosperity gospel. It's not some, once I make that decision of crucifying that old man, as I was told, that everything's going to be wonderful and in a bed of roses. No. But he said, I thank my God through Jesus Christ. That's the solution. So if you're here tonight and you want to study more, I'm sure these men here, I will, whatever it needs to be done to answer your questions, to make sure your relationship with God is correct. If you've been studying, you know you need to repent of your sins. You know what it means to confess Jesus Christ and why you would be baptized for the remission of sins. If you know that and understand you've not done it, why would you put that off? There's nothing more important in your life than that decision. And that decision is just the first step of many decisions that you're going to make in your life with that relationship with God. Maybe you've made that relationship, but through that struggle, you've led it, maybe that tug of war, to get fed on the wrong side. And you find yourself, you know, and that tug of war, what's kind of funny, I didn't tell you the end of the story, but I laughed several times because sooner or later the kids got drugged down, face down in the dirt. And there's nothing that makes me happy to see kids, kids just face planting it right in the dirt. Getting up, ah! But that's us. You're going to find yourself face down in the dirt if you keep feeding the wrong side. Be careful. Entertainment, associations, recreation, whatever it is. Whatever's keeping you to feed that side, get rid of it. God even said, it'd be better to pluck out your eye, to cut off your arm, and go to heaven and have everything and go to hell. But if you know you have a need tonight to make your life right with God, we'd love to pray with you, pray for you, help you any way we can. Brother Island has selected our invitation song, and if we can help you, be glad to do so as together we stand and we sing.